I want to talk to you today about women of influence. Women of influence. There's some women in our lives that change the course of our lives, and we're grateful for that today. And we're not just going to focus, you know, I'm, I'm honored today that it is Mother's Day and we celebrate you today. And if you came in uh, early enough, you, you received a, a little marker that we gave you this morning that we just want to remind you of how great you are in God. Not because of us, but because of the God that is in us, we are great. Amen. And, and we, do, we do great things in the Lord. But I want to tell you today that we are surrounded by women of influence. <clears throat> Excuse me. How many of you ever been influenced by a woman? <clears throat> Keep good thoughts in your mind right there. <laughs> Psalm 68, if you're there, let's say it together. Lord, <clears throat> may the word change me. Verse number 11, and it would say this in Psalm 68. The Lord announces the word, and the women who proclaim it are a mighty throng. The Lord announces his word, and the women who proclaim it are a mighty throne. That sounds to me like a great group of women of influence. Women are influential not because what, what they have to offer, but, but, but because of what God has instilled in them. The Lord announces the word. The women who proclaim it are a mighty throne. You know what that means? That the women who are carrying the words of the Lord cannot be stopped, cannot be hindered, cannot be detoured. I am grateful this morning to be able to tell you that women of influence change the world. I want to give you this idea this morning. As, as, you, as you flip back, we're going to eventually go to Proverbs 31. You can't have Mother's Day without Proverbs 31. We're going to get there in a little bit. I'm honored today to tell you that God created man in his own image. And after God created man, he looked at it and said, it's good. But then he said, I think I might be able to do just a little better. <laughs> so he took a portion of the man that he created and he took a part of him out. He removed a rib. And he said, I think I can do you one better. So he created a woman. And God stepped back and looked at woman and said, Mm, it's good. It's good. I figured I'd have a few more amens on that. I'll, I'll just preach to myself this morning. I, I, lo I look at my woman sometimes and I say, mm, it's good. Amen. The Lord was proud of that creation. Amen. I want every woman in this room to know and to understand when the Lord looks at you, no matter your hair color, no matter your hair length, no matter the size, if you go to the store and you buy a size 2 or a size 14, God still steps back and looks at it and says, mm, that's good. Because you are his daughter, you are a woman of influence, God loves you, amen. To God, there's no one like you. He created you exactly the way that he wants you to be. See, stay... Stan, you and I right now are the only two men in this room willing to say that the Lord looked at man and said, I can do one better. Amen. You, me, you look at all these men in this room. You and I, Stan. I got one amen in this room. I'm going to preach right at you today, brother. All the other men, you guys are missing out. Stan, are they missing out? They're missing out. They missing out. <laughs> Calm down now, I'm preaching. I want to read you something that I came across a couple years ago and modified it and amended it and changed it a little bit to better fit Covenant Church. To every mother and to every woman, we celebrate you on this day. To every mother and every woman living a godly example before a younger generation, we applaud you. To every single mother, we encourage you. To every mother who has lost a child, we mourn and remember with you. To those of you who are mentor moms and spiritual moms, we need you more than ever. To the mothers who have prodigals and your heart breaks, we pray with you. To the mothers praying for their children, we admire you. 
to the mothers who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To the mom who is working hard, yet struggling, we encourage you not to give up. To the mother teaching and training as the Lord commands, we simply say good job. To those mothers who have lived through driving tests, <laughs> medical tests, and overall testing of your nerves and motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To the single women hoping to one day be a mother, may the Lord grant you that prayer. And to the woman who is praying to be a mother, but that seems unachievable to you, we encourage you to keep praying and to keep dreaming and trust the Lord. To the mother who is titled stepmom, mm. We journey with you on this complex road and we say thank you because the job is not easy. To the mothers who did not run from the challenges, the many, many challenges of being a mother, but you did not run. You cried. You thought about pulling out your hair. You thought about beating somebody. But you did not run away. <laughs> We support you, and we say thank you, and we say, way to go. To the moms in this room and to the moms watching who feel lost, sometimes you do not have all the answers that you wish that you had. There's not a perfect roadmap teaching you how to be a mother, teaching you by the time you become a grandmother, it seems so easy. But to be a mother, there's not a roadmap, and you feel lost. Many share that experience, and we just want you to know it's going to be okay. To the mother who has disappointments, you have heartaches, you have distance with your children, we support you and pray for you during this difficult time. To every mother who has pulled out her hair, to every mother who has lost sleep, to every mother who is going broke because you're a mother, <laughs> to every mother who is working multiple jobs, or longer hours on the job, whoo, yet you still have enough love in your heart to love those babies every single day of your life. We say Happy Mother's Day. To every child, young and old, who have lost your mother, we cry with you. We support you on this day. We don't forget you. To every child, young and old, without a mother, not everyone is blessed to have a mother. To every child, young and old, without a mother, May the God of all heaven, may the God of all of creation comfort you and love you. And may every godly woman in this room, young and old, be available and ready at the moment's notice that you need them. And once again, to every woman in this room, it is Mother's Day and we do say Happy Mother's Day. But we also say we celebrate all the women of God and all of God's creation in this room. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Amen. Amen. The Lord announces the word, and the women who proclaim it are a mighty throne. Ordinary women, ordinary, you, 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 we think that we're sitting beside of ordinary women. And to you, they may be ordinary women, but they have extraordinary influence. Ordinary women who have extraordinary influence. I look across this room left to right, front to back, and I see a lot of women who just think to themselves that they're just another lady. That I'm, just, just, I'm just a woman. And you're right. You are a, a woman. God created you to be such that. Tall, short. It doesn't matter. You are a woman, and you are a woman of God. But you're not just ordinary. If you are a daughter of God, just that title alone already identifies you that you have extraordinary influence in the kingdom of God. You can absolutely change the world. All of you need to put on the cape or, or whatever is required and call yourself Wonder Woman because you have extraordinary influence. You may be ordinary to some folks, and, and yes, sometimes your children and your husband or your friends, they may, they may not always give you the praise that you're worthy of, but you're extraordinary in God's sight and you have extraordinary influence even though you're ordinary you're extraordinary 
I want you to think about Mary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys an eye-opener here real quick, okay? Mary was the carrier of the only begotten Son of God. Would you call that extraordinary? Yeah. This woman had influence. But I want to caution you this morning. Mary was an, I mean, she was just an amazing young lady. But I want, to, I want to remind you something this morning. I have a lot of people that come to me and they say, Pastor, I just want to pray that whatever the Lord wants me to do, I want to do that. How many of you prayed that prayer? Whatever the Lord wants me to do, I want to do that. I want to warn you this morning, Mary prayed that prayer. <laughs> Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Lord, I just love you with everything within me. And then, then an angel came and said, uh, Mary, you prayed a prayer. And you said, well, Lord, whatever you want me to do. And some, somebody's right now just thinking, Lord, I retract that prayer. I retract that prayer. And, and the glory of God came down and the angel of the Lord came down and said, Mary, you have found favor in the sight of God. You have found favor. It's great when the influential women of God find favor. But for Mary, could you imagine being a teenager and God sends an angel down and the angel says, uh, uh, you prayed and said, Lord, whatever you want, want me to do, I'll do. And, the, and the, the, the Lord has put a request upon you, Mary, that you would carry the only begotten Son of God. And, and could, you, um, could you imagine Mary's response? I know that we preach this real good on Easter and Christmas and all this stuff, but I'm just going to tell you something. When you're a teenage young girl, and God sends an angel down, and the angel says, uh, God wants you to carry his child. Can you imagine what your response would be? I've watched some of you ladies, influential ladies, and your response is whenever God asks you to do other things. Whenever God says, I want you to go over and hug that person that's been gossiping about you. But Mary, I'm going to just move on. I can, they're looking at me, man. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm old enough now to know when to move on. I used to preach that stuff. Now when they look at me, say, like, like, baby, why are you wearing a hat today? You look pretty. Why are you wearing a hat? She said, because when you say certain things, I'm going to give you that look. She said, that, that way nobody else can see me. Mary. <laughs> Mary was an ordinary woman with extraordinary influence. I also think of Anna in Luke chapter 2. Anna was a widow of great age. And when they brought the baby Jesus to be, to be dedicated, Simon had performed this dedication. And here is this great widow. This great widow who, who came to the temple of the Lord and stayed there. She, she was up in age, and you go to Luke chapter 2 and you read this for yourself. She was the prophetess who had the honor of bearing witness to the dedication of Jesus. Imagine what it would have been like. And even, even the man that dedicated Jesus and, and the prophetess that, that, that bore witness to the dedication of Jesus, they were saying that now that they had completed that event, that Simon even said, my life can end. Basically, he said, I can go ahead and die now because I have fulfilled everything that I needed to do. And here was this woman. Anna, standing in the temple, and those of you that know the story, you know this. When, when they brought the baby Jesus and she bore witness of his dedication, what did she say? She said, I'll proclaim this all the days of my life. In other words, and I, I'm, I'm going to step on a few toes here, Anna was saying, I'm going to preach, and they're going to tell me to be quiet. They're going to tell me that I'm a woman, and I shouldn't be doing that, but I just bore witness to the dedication of the Son of God, and I'm going to preach it. I'm going to let them know. I'm going to share with them exactly. And, 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 you know, people don't like this type of preaching sometimes, but the first woman who bore witness to the dedication and was able to preach about it was a woman. And her name was Anna. I think about Deborah. Some of you are going to like this one. Deborah was a prophetess in the Old Testament, Judges 4 and 5. If you go back and read, uh, Deborah, here it was. She was a prophetess, and she was judging Israel. Now, this is the part that will surprise some of you because you didn't know this was in the Bible. There was a commander named Barak. And Barak was afraid to go to war. The man who was in charge of the army was afraid to go to war. And Deborah went up to him and said, Barak, what are you doing? Don't you know that God has told you to do this? And you know what Barak said? Barak said, the only way that I'll go is if you, Deborah, go with me. 
I'm talking about women that change the course of history simply by being mighty women of God, simply by being women of influence. And here we have this commander. Now, you would think to yourself that if Barak was able to be the commander of the army, that he must have had some qualities that made him uh, be in that position. If you're going to be a general, you don't get there just because you opened up a box of Cheerios this morning and there was a toy inside. You get there because you've got qualities and you've got things that get you to that point. But could you imagine? Imagine whenever Deborah said, hey, uh, it is time for you to get up and take the Lord's army and go in and do what God has commanded to do. And Barak just bowed his head and said, Deborah, sister prophetess, woman of influence, I will only go if you go with me. She strapped up her boots and she said, all right, then I'll go with you. And guess what happened? The Lord brought them through and did exactly what he said, but only because Deborah, the prophetess, stood up and did her job. Had the women of God not did their job and did what they were... Us men, we would not be where we are today would we, if, if women of influence did not do what God had called them to do. I'm going to just keep going. Esther. Everybody knows the story of Esther pretty much. Talk about this pretty little lady planted in a, in a pagan palace. God put her there on purpose. You guys know this story for such a time as this. You see, some of you ladies, you wonder why God's got you in the mess. And, and you know, sometimes you, you get yourself in the mess. But then there's other times that you're, you're in a bad place and you know God's got you there. Don't give up on God because he's got you in that mess because he's looking for you to be the change in that mess. He's looking for you to, to change things around. And here she was in a pagan palace so that she could influence a king to spare an entire group of people. Do you know that all of her people were saved because of her? A lot of folks, uh, they question and they wonder, why was Esther, why did she become king? <clears throat> so that God could save a people. He, he, could, he could have used a man. He could have chose a donkey. But he chose a little lady named Esther. Women in this room, I want you to understand something. When the Lord calls you and when he calls your name, it's for a specific purpose of God. God looked down the portals of time and saw that there was a plan to destroy his people. And he looked through the entire congregation and the best person he found was a pretty little lady named Esther. For such a time as this. That's a woman of influence. A woman of influence. I think about Abigail. Abigail, now some, some of you ladies will like this one. Abigail wasn't married to the smartest guy in the room. Why are you laughing? Some, sometimes. Let's see other people laugh. They don't know the story. Is that what you're saying? A lot of them must not know the story. She's like, I don't know. I'm going to preach back on this side. Sometimes he might look good. He's not always the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> Looks can only get you so far. I got her. <laughs> yeah, you got a week to go, brother. We. Is there still more counseling to be done? Are we, are we done with counseling? Okay. <clears throat> Abigail had this husband. Abigail had, had this husband. I know some of you think that you're the only one. She had this husband. He was, he was a knucklehead. He was stubborn. He was ignorant. He was in charge. But he refused to listen to anybody. See, they're, they're being quiet because they're being nice. Because they're sitting beside of them. So Abigail had this knuckle-headed husband. And it was because of Abigail. You talk about a picture of grace and a, and a picture of courage. <clears throat> now, she diffused and intervened in stopping a, stopping a battle. And she saved a lot of people's lives. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 25, you can read this story. Her husband refused to listen to the soon King David. And the soon King David was just going to come and kill him and all of his men. But Abigail, Abigail went to the king and, and she said, can I, can I just paraphrase it? How many of you know the story of Abigail? Shout amen. amen. Okay, at least half, 
Well, about half of you do. First Samuel chapter 25, she basically went to the king without her husband knowing. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go behind your husband's back, but sometimes there's a necessity, amen, to, to right the wrongs of the knucklehead that you married because he looked good when he was 20, but now that he's 60, amen, you just praying for him, you just praying for him, and uh, he, you know, he, you love him, and he's a good man. Hey, uh, Pastor Bob, why are you looking at your wife right now? You love him, and, and he's, he's a good man, but sometimes you got to fix the messes that he gets himself into. So Abigail went to David and she said, listen, David, you know my husband. You know he, he, he he's smart, but he's just, sometimes he overlaps and sometimes, you know, he's just, it don't all come together. And, and, and David, I want to apologize on behalf of my husband. And, and David knew that, that her husband didn't know she was there, but she made it right. And David said, because of what you have done, I will forgive the offense, and you have saved many people's lives on this day. Because of this woman's courage, being able and willing to step forth, a lot of lives were saved. And it just so happened that, that <clears throat> the rest of the story goes, it's not so funny you know, after you read the rest of the story, because David prayed against this man, and this man died. David said, Lord, he's come against me, and I just, you know... <laughs> I'm not telling you, you know, just because he's a knucklehead, don't pray that prayer, okay? <laughs> Four of them. <laughs> and Bo just shaking his head. Bo said, I can't believe he's preaching this sermon. <clears throat> Zipporah is another example of an ordinary woman with extra, extraordinary influence. How many of you know who Moses is? Everybody knows Moses. Do you know that Moses would not have finished his ministry had it not been for his wife? Do you know that Moses, how many of you know Moses did not see the promised land because he was disobedient to God? That's why Moses didn't get into the promised land. But what a lot of folks don't realize, if you go back and read the story earlier, Moses could have gotten in much more trouble and his ministry could have come to a soon end early on had it not been for his wife. Had his wife not stepped in, had Zipporah not stepped in because all of the males were supposed to be circumcised. And Moses neglected for this to happen. And if you were not circumcised, then you were not of the covenant of God. That was the way that it worked in the Old Testament. And Moses was neglecting to circumcise his own sons. So his wife stepped in and said, in order for your ministry to be saved, and in order for you to have favor in the sight of God, this has got to happen. So she stepped up. She did the job. She not only saved his life, she saved his ministry. Thank God sometimes there are women of influence that when we can't do the job they come behind us and they support us and they they lift us up and I'm grateful today I can tell you this there's been times where I've wanted to quit and there's been times where I didn't have it all together and thank God there was a woman of influence there who was able to speak to me and sometimes you guys you guys don't know this but sometimes when I go home uh, the first person that tells me when I do something right is my wife she's the first person to say baby this was great and that was grand but on the flip side of that, when we get in the car, she's also the first person to tell me, why would you do that? And why would you say that? She, she's, not only, she's not only the one that tells me that, that it's on full, but she's also the one that tells me it's on empty. She's got a little bit of Sephora in her. Women of influence. And then you've got Priscilla. I'm just going to name a few of them here. Priscilla and Aquila, most of you have heard of that story. This woman was uprooted and moved out of her hometown. She was kicked out, but she continued to have influence on a young man named Paul. Paul continuously said, <clears throat> he talked about Phoebe and Priscilla. Paul, if you read the New Testament and Paul's writings, he was continuously giving honor to the women who helped in the ministry. Do you know that Paul was assisted by Priscilla and Aquila? Do you know that Paul's ministry flourished partly because of Priscilla? Women of influence. Do you know that she was, uh, she was partly put in charge to help train a young apostle named Apollos? 
It was because of Priscilla, and you, you, you know, sometimes people say, well, God could have done this through other people. He could have used other people. I agree with you. But I love that God uses women of influence to carry about a change in the world because it would get boring if he just used men all the time. Amen? I'm grateful that God uses women. So this woman, if you go and you read it, when Paul needed help, she was uprooted for her, from her home. That did not stop her. Listen, when the waves came and the storms came and she lost her house and she was uprooted and had to move because where she lived, they hated Christianity, that did not stop her from advancing the kingdom of God. She looked at Paul and she said, revival's got to continue. Whether I live in my house, whether I don't live in my house, whether I'm uprooted or not, I love me some women up in church that says, I don't care what's going on on the outside. Revival's got to continue. The move of God has got to continue. The kingdom of God has got to continue advancing. Can you imagine just for a moment, imagine where the kingdom would be without the women of God. Imagine where the kingdom would be without the women of God. I can tell you today that when we're in church services sometimes and the Spirit of God comes in, I always love the Lord can choose to use who he wants. And sometimes he picks a man and sometimes he picks a woman. But imagine right now, if you took all the women out of this room and, and just, you know, booted them out, we would lose more than half the crowd. Imagine how many of you in this room are saved because a woman prayed for you. Amen. How many of you are saved because a grandma prayed for you? Amen. Women of influence like Priscilla. Priscilla could have said, I've been uprooted from my home. Amen. The church doesn't like me. The church has told me I'm a woman and I need to be silent. But Paul the Apostle has told me that in order for the kingdom of God to advance, I must assist him in his ministry. And then Paul the Apostle tells her that she needs to help in, in training Apollos. I'm going to tell you something today. The kingdom of God stops advancing when the women of influence don't recognize their giftings in God. And when the church of God tells the women of God to sit down and be quiet, you're going to be sitting in a dead church because women carry the word of God. They carry the power of God. They carry the anointing of God. And women have the influence of God, and it changes lives. Amen. I'm grateful for women of influence. Grateful. There's great men preachers. There's great women preachers. There's always folks that don't always agree with women doing certain things. I just pointed out biblically several women who were used in ministry. They weren't called. I've had people say to me, well, pastor, you know, you keep calling women in the ministry and, and it's unbiblical. I said, well, God did it. I mean, God was the one that called Mary. God was the one that chose Anna. God was the one that called Deborah. She was already a prophetess. I didn't appoint her a prophetess. And, and Esther and Abigail and Zipporah and Priscilla. I mean, if Paul can use a woman, I, I'm, all, I'm all about women of influence. Proverbs 31, verses 25 and 26. Strength and honor are her clothing. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in the times to come. She opens her mouth, and wisdom is on her tongue, and it is the law of kindness. Strength and honor are her clothing. Leaving that verse up there for a moment, I'm sometimes amazed by the strength of women. I watch women and men have children, and I watch a man run. And I'll watch a woman become father and mother, caretaker, provider, protector. I'll watch a woman step into that role. Now, are there men that have done it? Yes, there are. Congratulations to those men. But bar none, women take on that role a lot more than men do. And boy, do they do a good job. Amen. Women, when, the, when, when, it gets, when it gets tough, when life gets challenging, they go into the bathroom they close the door, they cry, they wipe off their makeup, they think about slapping somebody, 
And then they come out to the mess and they stand up in strength and honor and they meet life head on. And they do what is necessary to be done. That's why some of y'all haven't lost your mind. Because you're clothed with strength and honor. That's why you can't give up because you're clothed in strength and honor. That's why that for, for, those, for those folks who, who have fought depression and those folks who have fought suicide, that's why God can't allow you to do that because he's clothed you with strength and honor. And that, that is what you wake up in the morning and when your eyes blink, you're already clothed with strength and honor. God has given you, amen, the courage to do great things. And I know that we're living in a world and, and the world talks talks about men leading men doing this and men that there's nothing wrong with a man leading the house but women are clothed in strength and honor you go ahead and spend nine hours with those two and three year olds all day long and see what happens to your mind amen and then tell me why God clothed them with strength and with honor when's the last time you saw a man breastfeeding come on God has clothed them with strength and with honor they do things that we cannot do when those kids drive you crazy, you want to, you know, I got to go mow the grass. You mowed the grass yesterday. I got to go mow the grass. It grew that fast overnight. I got to get out of this house. I, I got to go and I got to work in the building. I got to do this. And she says, you're leaving me with these kids. Baby, I got to go out and work. The reason you can't do it is because you're not the one clothed with strength and with honor. Amen. And you just look at her and you're like, listen, if you need to slap them, slap them. I got to go cut the grass, baby. I got to go. Husbands that are like, I cannot change a diaper. I just cannot do it. And she's like, go change the diaper. And you're just like, I can't do it. I can't change the diaper. The reason you can't do what she can do is you're not clothed with strength and honor. God has gifted women. God has gifted women to be women. Men have special gifts and talents. Women have special gifts and special talents. Don't, don't wake up tomorrow and say to yourself that men, men have it better in the world. Don't ever let the world lie to you and say men have it better. Listen, God has called you to be a woman because this world needs women of influence. We need women of God to stand up and be women of God and women that will change the world. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law law of kindness, the qualities of women of influence. These are the qualities of women of influence. First of all, her spirit, the spirit of God that lives within a woman of influence. Love is the second thing. Women are full of love. I know that sometimes we, we, all, ha we all have mood swings. We all have days. But overall, women of influence are filled with love. Women of influence give counsel. They give wisdom. I love to see the younger generation coming to an older generation and receiving counsel, receiving, receiving wisdom from them. And, and they're an encourager. I, I, my, my wife, sometimes I, 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 I worry about her and I wonder about her. She can be having the baddest of days and, and just, you know, the sky is falling and, and she, she's got every reason to give up. And somebody calls her on the phone, man, and, and suddenly a, a switch flips and she becomes this encourager. She's encouraging somebody that is in a much less dire situation than she's in, but she's taking time out to encourage them. I, I, I love the encouraging spirit of, of, a, of a woman, of a mother. And, and then we talk about women of influence being empowering. They, they are equal. Whipping. And, you know, women of influence are always telling their husbands and their children and their grandchildren, they'll tell you you look good when you don't look good. They'll, they'll tell you you're brilliant when you're dumb as a rock. Let's just be honest. Women of influence, man, they know how to encourage you. They know how to equip you. They know how to, how to motivate you. They're always telling you to be better than you think you can be. They're always encouraging you to go further than you think you can go. Mothers and wives just have an instinct about them to encourage you to do great things. And, and they're, they're good example. They're role models. Now, I'm, I'm preaching this in general. I know that not everybody had a good experience with their mothers. But, but overall, overall with, with the women that I know, in my life, the godly women in my life, if our daughters can grow up to be like them, we're going to be in good shape in the future. We've got good things going on. Women are always gracious. Women of influence, if, it, if they're an influential woman, they're, they're always gracious and they're always compassionate. Even when they have a right not to be, 
They're always compassionate, even when they don't need to be, and they always give comfort. I, I, I don't know what it is about a mother. A father can't always do this. I, 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 women, women just have an instinct to give comfort when things go bad. Yes. <laughs> you guys, some of the men in this room, you know what I'm talking about? I've been in situations when, we, when, when, when our oldest was put on life support. However many years ago, whenever he was put on life support, we're all sitting in this room and my wife is breaking down. I didn't have a clue what to do. Can I get an amen from any man in this room? Like, I, I, I had no clue what to do. And sometimes men, we just think to ourselves, if we don't know what to do, just say nothing. Sometimes that's smart and sometimes that's idiotic. <clears throat> but the only thing you know to do is to maybe give a hug or get, you don't, it's not always built into us to how to be comforting. It's just not there. And so thankfully there was, there was other women in the room who knew how to give comfort. The, the last one is sacrifice. I'm going to say this to you this morning. Every woman of influence is already a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. You don't become an influential woman without being a living sacrifice. You sacrifice your time, your sanity. Amen. You sacrifice your money. You sacrifice everything that you've had. How many, how many of you men in this room have noticed that the mothers in this room, and, and I applaud my wife many times uh, for the effort. I'm just going to throw this out there. You know, I could do this all day. I, I, I applaud. I, when I was younger, I used to think to myself, you know, it's like, you know, men, men, men like women. That's, I do. That's, that's, na that's in that nature. And men, men are visual. Men, men, men will look. That's, that's the way men are. And I remember myself whenever I was younger, I was thinking to myself, you know, and I knew some, I knew some moms or some women. I thought to myself, you know what, if they take care of themselves, they'd be pretty. And then, y'all don't know where I'm going yet. Don't hate me yet. And then when I became a father, I realized why some of them was lucky to make it out the door. Yeah. Throw that hair in a ponytail. Amen. Put up. <laughs> throw on some flip flops and some some what you know whatever's. If you got to get it out of the out of the hamper, you pull it and you're lucky. You're lucky you got out the door with those kids this morning. You know, don't don't be asking me to look pretty. You're lucky I ain't smacked you in the face already. Amen. Don't don't be bringing that out of me this morning. I will look good when I want to look good. I can look good if I want to look good. But right now, I just want to keep my sanity and get out in the door. Women of influence are always sacrificing, always doing for others what they could be doing for themselves. Women in this room, I'm gonna say this in closing. There's a lot of women in this room and a lot of women watching who do not live their lives the way that they could possibly live their lives because they sacrificed their life to live for other people. 